Hello and a warm welcome to everyone watching. I'm Greg Blackman. I'm the editor of Imaging and Machine Vision Europe. And today we're going to be looking at uh, event-based imaging, otherwise known as neuromorphic vision or neuromorphic sensing. There are you know, various ways of referring to it. So it's a technology that operates a bit differently to standard image sensor. And I'm sure that Luca, one of our speakers, is going to explain it a bit better than me. But it but it essentially doesn't capture the scene frame by frame, but detects changes in the scene. So it can therefore reach quite impressive um, performance metrics. Uh, it won the Vision Award at Vision Stuttgart, or at least Prophecies Technology won the Vision Award. So that's recognition, I suppose, at least from the industrial vision side, that it's now at a stage where the products are out there and it can be applied in the, in the real world. So I'm delighted to say that joining me are Luca Ver, um, the CEO and co-founder of Prophecy, who's going to give us a bit of insight into event-based vision and tell us what it can do. And also Josh Gibson, he's a senior physicist at Cambridge Consultant, uh, who are just actually down the road from uh, where I am in Cambridge in the UK at the moment. So, um, And the team at Cambridge Consultants have developed this product for the life sciences using a, a Prophecy Sense. So we're going to hear a bit about that device. So, so welcome to you both. Um, uh, so also just a couple of notes. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Macnica ATD Europe. Um, they distribute properties images. And also I'd just like to note that after we've heard from the two speakers, we're going to do a short Q&A session. So please do send in your questions for Josh and Luca and we'll just get to those at the end. Um, so without Further ado, I'm gonna. I'd like to give the floor to Luca to tell us a bit about uh, event-based vision and what Prophecy is working on. So, Luca, the, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Greg, and um, I'm glad to be here today with uh, with you and Josh and with uh, um, uh, the the audience listening and watching us. So, um, uh, let me share my screen, and then I will walk you through some slides sorry one second yeah okay do you see my screen hopefully so so i'm luca tio co-founder prophecy i co-founder paris uh, we are the technology leader in neuromorphic vision sensor and systems. Uh, our vision sensor mimics the human eye and our computer, vi vi computer vision AI algorithm mimic the way the brain uh, works. As opposed to conventional frame-based technology, as you described earlier, that capture information by sequence of images, our vision sensor, like the human eye, is only reacting to changes in the scene, only to what is uh, moving. Uh, and this lead to unprecedented uh, uh, performance figures in terms of efficiency, in terms of speed, in terms of uh, uh, dynamic range, so robustness to uh, changing lighting conditions. We started with the very first implementation of our technology for vision restoration of blind, and since then uh, our journey has opening up uh, uh, opportunities in various fields of applications, including industrial, IoT, and more recently robotics and mobile. Uh, we are a venture-backed company. We raised so far about $100 million from both corporate and financial investors, such as uh, Sony, Intel, Bosch, uh, Xiaomi, Renault Nissan, and uh, the European Investment Bank, and many others. Um, as a market leader, uh, we have been uh, uh, actually uh, spending also uh, some of uh, uh, focus on, on um, growing our IP portfolio with more than 50 patents. We are uh, a group of today uh, more than 100 engineers, uh, mostly based in France, in Paris and Grenoble, uh, but we also uh, uh, grow our presence uh, recently in China, in Shanghai, as well as in Japan and the US. Our business model is um, quite straightforward uh, in the sense we are a semiconductor fabulous company. We do the entire design of the chip, of the vision sensor, of the silicon retina, uh, and we work with partners like uh, Sony to do the manufacturing. And uh, then we sell the component, we sell the chip, 
Uh, but we also provide uh, uh, our uh, uh, software development kit, MetaVision Intelligence, uh, to our customer, to our partners, in order to let them basically develop uh, an entire kit. On the right side of the screen, actually, you see some of the uh, name of partners in the ecosystem that are currently actively working with Prophecy to deliver to uh, the market uh, a full uh, neuromorphic or event-based. So how the technology works? So, uh, as mentioned, the vision sensor mimics the human eye in the sense that it uh, is not producing an entire image. Each single pixel is independent and asynchronous and reacting only to what is changing in the scene, like you see in the video here. Uh, when I move in front of our camera, our sensor, our sensor is not producing an image. Like, for example, the background, which is static, is not being acquired. And only what is uh, changing, so my shoulders, my eyes, my hands that are moving, produce uh, events. And the way we do it is by uh, embedding some analog processing inside each single pixel, making it uh, uh, independent and asynchronous, and capable to react only when there is a relative change of light by uh, implementing a so-called level crossing sampling inside each single each single pixel. So the first uh, key benefit of this acquisition approach is that, as you can realize from uh, the data, which are the raw data coming out of the sensor uh, in this uh, video, uh, the, uh, the, data, the, the amount of data is uh, uh, drastically reduced compared to a conventional frame-based approach, because as long as there is no change in the scene, in fact, there is no, no information, there are no data being produced by our, uh, by our sensor. So efficiency is one of the key uh, value of the technology, which I would like to emphasize by showing this side-by-side uh, -side video, where on the left side you see a regular camera, uh, and on the right side you see a prophecy event-based neuromorphic camera that again is reacting mostly to edges, uh, because uh, this is what essentially uh, uh, trigger new changes when there is a there is a motion uh, in the scene. Um, so the purpose of our technology is not, in fact, uh, purely imaging. So uh, our technology is meant uh, for um, computer vision and, and AI applications. Uh, so naturally, from our sensor, you get the pure information that uh, uh, is necessary to uh, to do some machine vision or machine learning task. Like for example, in this uh, in this example, it could be eye blinking detection or uh, gesture recognition or uh, gaze tracking, etc. So instead of uh, actually acquiring a sequence of images at a fixed point in time and extracting image by image and pixel by pixel what is changing, you get basically the changes directly, natively uh, from the sensor itself. So this makes actually the approach, the mathematical approach to uh, computer vision and AI simpler and more efficient. So another key benefit of the technology is uh, speed, as I mentioned earlier. Each single pixel is not constrained anymore by a fixed uh, frame rate. There is no uh, fact, uh, a clock in the system. Uh, the acquisition is, uh, is analog, and uh, uh, essentially each single pixel fires an event as soon as there is a relative change of light, either an increase or decrease. So the way we like to uh, display this uh, speed, uh, this low reaction time of, uh, of uh, our technologies by, for example, assuming that we are observing a, a white disk with a black dot, which is rotating, uh, instead of producing a sequence of images at a fixed point in time, which is what you would, uh, we, you would get with a regular frame sensor, you basically acquire a continuous stream of event. So this video essentially shows uh, this representation where on the left side, you have uh, a sequence of images, uh, which is what you would get with a regular sensor. Assuming, for example, you have a camera running at 10 frames per second, in one, sec in one second time window, you will get basically 10 images. Right? And sometimes it would be very difficult to understand the motion of the black dot, because depending on the, on the speed of the, of the rotating disk, this may be uh, more or less uh, complicated. Actually, the event-based sensor, as you can see on the right side, is reacting as soon as the, the, the black dot is uh, translating from one pixel to the adjacent pixel, producing this uh, uh, almost time-continuous spiral of event. And this approach is uh, uh, extremely interesting, not only because it gives a higher time precision of the changes, uh, which can reduce latency and uh, enable uh, certain application to reach a high level of uh, safety standard, for example, like in robotics or automotive, uh, 
Uh, but also uh, the fact that we get this high time precision makes certain mathematical models behind fundamental computer vision and AI algorithms simpler, like for example, computing an optical flow or a, a tracking, because you get this uh, 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 time precision that uh, uh, enable uh, a simpler update of, uh, uh, for example, a tracking uh, uh, model, a tracking kernel, or uh, an estimation of uh, a velocity vector for a moving object in the scene. So efficiency, speed uh, are key properties of the technology, as well as uh, uh, dynamic range, wide dynamic range. We exceed uh, more than 120 dB dynamic range. Um, the reason is also uh, intrinsic, is native in, in the design of the sensor because we have pixels that are independent and asynchronous. They also optimize independently their own exposure time, which lead to a very wide dynamic range. So the capability basically to handle situation where you have very, very dark and very bright part of the scene at the same time. Like for example, we, we represent in this, um, in this slide, uh, when we are in a car, we are exiting a, a tunnel a quite challenging situation for a conversion frame based camera because uh, either you look at the dark part of the scene or, or at the bright part of the scene but it's very challenging to actually uh, look at both parts of the scene with the same uh, precision uh, at the same time so all this benefit of speed efficiency and dynamic range are happening at the same time so leading really to uh, new possibilities in the field of uh, uh, machine vision and ai uh, we are also glad uh, of our partnership with Sony. Sony is the market leader in convention image sensor. And we started this collaboration with Sony more than three years ago. Um, and uh, uh, Sony gave us access to uh, one of the most advanced technology process in image sensor, which is a BSI 3D stack process. And this uh, uh, technology uh, migration has been fundamental for us because we managed to build the smallest uh, event-based sensor, which is today in mass production and available in the market. Um, so this is currently being, together with Sony, deployed in several applications covering industrial and uh, uh, IoT. Uh, together with uh, uh, the sensor, Prophecy is also investing uh, heavily in providing to, to the market, to the ecosystem partners, uh, MetaVision Intelligence Suite, which is a, a software development kit containing uh, uh, almost 100 algorithms of computer vision and AI, uh, several code samples and ready-to-use applications, uh, for example, to do uh, high-speed counting, vibration measurement, uh, to do some object tracking, uh, edge-led tracking, as well as several tools for machine learning, like, for example, uh, a tool for, for data collection, uh, for... Uh, training, model training, as well as pre-trained model, uh, and uh, uh, also uh, several available uh, data set of pre-trained data, label data. So all, all this is available because as, as we are coming to the market with a new, a new technology, new technology standard, uh, we need to uh, also uh, uh, enable the market with uh, um, uh, tools and, uh, and assets uh, to uh, uh, easily adopt uh, the, the technology. We also last year decided to, for example, uh, push uh, uh, an open source architecture of our software for the same purpose of enabling a community of researchers and engineers to keep developing and experimenting with our technology. A few applications that we have been uh, in, in unlocking uh, uh, with our customers. Um, one is particle object size monitoring. It's uh, quite straightforward for our technology that enable high speed machine vision in real time uh, with uh, a speed that are uh, reaching 500,000 pixels per second with counting precision, precision that can exceed 99%. Um, the reason is that uh, uh, almost natively you get uh, uh, from from uh, moving part of the scene a, a motion segmentation, and from this motion segmentation you can uh, detect and track a moving part uh, of the scene, like for example pills in a, in a pharmaceutical process or grains in a food and beverage process uh, or cells. Uh, and this is what we have done with uh, Cambridge Consult has been has been doing uh, working on our on our sensor. Um, another uh, field of application uh, which we have been opening, uh, which does not really have a vision-based solution today, is vibration monitoring. Um, any machine or part of machine are vibrating 
uh, because of some motion due to the uh, motor compressor. And vibrations uh, are um, actually actually change of vibrations are a possible indication of a of a failure mode in a machine because the vibration is kind of you can see it as a as a, as an indication for the health status of of a machine. And we are able, uh, with our technology at the pixel level, to monitor uh, up to several uh, tens of kilohertz of uh, uh, vibration frequency at the, with, with accuracy down to the pixel itself. And this gives us uh, a sort of uh, a heat map of vibrations, if you will, of, um, of a machine and, uh, and the capability to monitor uh, changes in frequency and amplitude in, in real time. And, and this can uh, uh, trigger um, uh, actions in predictive maintenance uh, that can avoid uh, failure and uh, reduce downtime of the machine or the entire process. So it's a very unique uh, application. Another one which is quite unique is pattern monitoring in the laser welding process, for example. We have been working with uh, several customers in the uh, automotive manufacturing industry where welding is a critical uh, part of their process uh, and, and uh, welding uh, quality control is, is, is very key and today sometimes it's done post-processing or manually. What we are able to do, as you can see in the video here, is that we can detect and track the sputter generated by the laser welding during the, during the process itself and we are able to uh, also uh, size, measure the size of, uh, of this particle and from all this information we can basically infer about the quality of the welding and in in a closed feedback loop we can essentially in real time control the speed and intensity of the laser uh, and and guaranteeing a high quality standard for the the, the, the welding processes so this is also quite a unique application that that actually put together uh, all these properties of the event based neuromorphic camera which are in terms of efficiency so low data rate which lead to uh, uh, basically high uh, uh, real-time performance, as well as uh, 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 wide dynamic range. Because this is a typical situation where due to the presence of the laser, uh, uh, the, the conditions of the environmental conditions are very, very challenging. Uh, with all this asset on, on the sensor and the software, we have uh, enabled, we are enabling a, a vast uh, uh, community of inventors, and we are really glad of the work that Cambridge Consultant has been pioneering in cell therapy, and we will uh, hear about that later, I, I think. Uh, we have been working also with other partners in, in the various parts of the world. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, we have been working with the University of Sydney, for example, uh, on application related to space situational awareness uh, with National University of Singapore uh, for uh, haptic feedback on uh, robotics. Uh, we have been working on microfluidic uh, analysis uh, with a consortium of universities, including University of Glasgow and Harriet Watt. And um, uh, we have been actually working since the, the beginning of the company on several projects related to vision restoration system, which remain one of our um, profound and uh, um, inspirational uh, activity, which is to uh, serve uh, application like the one developed by Gensight, which is one of our key customer and partner, uh, combining our technology with uh, certain optogenetic uh, uh, therapies uh, to restore uh, to restore sight of people who uh, are blind. So, uh, and this actually uh, uh, is, a, I think, is probably a good way to. Uh, to close this uh, this uh, presentation because it, I think it gives you uh, the real essence of uh, uh, of the technology, which is really um, which has really root in in the way uh, biology works. Uh, so this is uh, this uh, this application is the best example of uh, of uh, of how much this uh, uh, neuromorphic or bio inspired approach is close to reality. Uh, before I close, um, also I would like to indicate the fact that we are uh, uh, visit our website. You can also find several information about how to uh, start an evaluation with the technology. Several uh, uh, assets are available in terms of evaluation kit, uh, reference de design, development kit, and, and software as well, uh, so that you can uh, bootstrap with uh, with uh, a first evaluation of the technology before going to a full development. Thank you for your attention and uh, looking forward to your questions and to the discussion later. Thank, thanks very much, Luca. Um, yeah, we'll do questions after Josh has spoken, So, uh, but please 
do drop those questions in for Luca if you have any questions for Luca, and we'll get to those at the end. Uh, so up next, we've got Josh Gibson, who is going to tell us a bit about the work that um, he's been doing with Cambridge Consultants uh, about the life science project. So, so Josh, the floor is all yours. Great. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Luca. Um, can you see my slides? If I start to share them. I think we should, I think the audience should be able to see them, even if you cannot. Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, hi, I'm uh, Josh. I'm a physicist at Cambridge Consultants. Um, at Cambridge Consultants, we bring together teams of scientists and engineers and software developers and designers to um, help our clients to integrate new technologies like Prophecy's event-based camera into their products and to release kind of innovative and breakthrough products um, to the market. So it's been uh, great to be working with a new sensing technology over the last year. I have a background in optics, so it's been very interesting from that perspective, uh, and also a background in microfluidics and automating uh, processes. And so Pure Century has been a, a perfect opportunity to bring all of those uh, fields and interests of mine together. Um, and so today I'm going to talk to you about Pure Century, which is our automated contamination detection system that uses properties of M-based camera. So cell therapy is a huge and uh, hugely growing market. Um, it's the future of precision medicine. But I thought first off, before diving into why it's so good, it'd be, it'd be helpful to just think about what cell therapy is. Um, so your body has an immune system, and certainly through COVID, we're all very familiar with what that does. Um, we've heard lots about antibodies, and they, they flow around our body and help to fight off infections and certain diseases. Uh, but in the immune system, we also have uh, T cells. And these are uh, cells that flow around in our blood and they have uh, markers on them that can look for cells in our body which are misbehaving, that are not doing what they're supposed to do. And so they're good at fighting off infections. They work differently to antibodies, but they're, they're effective at their job. Um, but cancer is a pretty problematic disease. It's quite challenging, and um, it's very good at evading the immune system. And so what the intention of cell therapies is, is that if you have a sick patient with cancer, you take some of their blood out of them, and then you extract the T cells that the patient already has you carry out some genetic engineering to those T cells and improve the T cells ability to recognize the cancer that the patient has. You then go through a manufacturing process, which is where Pure Century is relevant, where you multiply those T cells and grow them in bioreactors so that instead of being tens or hundreds of um, engineered T cells, there are now millions. And then you inject those uh, bioengineered T cells back into the patient. And now the patient has a super set of T cells specifically designed to uh, find, recognize, and destroy the cancer that they have. Uh, and the body tends to not reject them because it is the patient's own cells. And so it is a, a fantastic process, and uh, cures are now available for certain types of cancer, primarily blood-borne cancers like leukemia, um, that are based on this reprogramming of patient cells. And you might have seen it in the news um, over the last week. Uh, it's been 10 years um, to the week since the first two patients in America were given cell and gene therapies. And within three months of being given this, uh, these uh, CAR T cells, the engineered T cells, the patients experienced complete remission from cancer um, and their body had fought off the cancer that they had. And then over the 10 years since with this follow-up study, they've had no reoccurrence of cancer, um, those two patients. And now they still have the genetically engineered T cells traveling around the body in their bloodstream, fighting off any potential cancerous cells that might start to reappear um, in them. So it is an incredible process, um, but it's, while it's a very sophisticated process, it requires genetic engineering, a lot of it is still very manual and labor intensive, and it requires people to be in clean rooms doing things by hand. And so this makes it really expensive. A single dose of a cell therapy um, can cost up to half a million dollars, um, and it has to be sterile to be given to a patient. That's part of the cost, because of course these patients are really uh, unwell with cancer, they often have immuno, um, they're often immunocompromised. And so if we had a contaminated uh, cell therapy batch that we gave to them, that patient's likely to get a secondary infection, be very unwell with it, and most likely die. Um, and this happens, not, not patients dying, but contaminated doses happen in 2% of batches, which when it costs half a million dollars per batch, that's a significant number, and it's a huge cost to manufacturers. But it's also a significant number of patients who don't have access to these life-saving treatments. Um, and ultimately, you know, aren't able to recover from their cancer. So it's really important to think about ways we can bring down the cost and make this a more accessible treatment so that 
the, the increasing numbers of people with cancers are able to get access to it. So the way that we make sure the cell, the uh, treatments are safe to give to patients is sterility testing. And this is obviously checking that the um, batch is sterile for the patient. And the standard way to do this is um, in the US is USP 71. And this is a, a manual process that takes uh, seven to 14 days, so one to two weeks. And in it, a person in a clean room, like on the picture on the right, um, will take a small sample um, out of the cell culture that's growing. They'll then culture that separately, and they'll monitor it for the seven to 14 days and see has their, their culture that they've got their test sample become cloudy. And if it's become cloudy, something's grown in it, and that means it's contaminated. So that's really manual. It requires people to go in, to take samples, to interact with the, the cell therapy treatment. Um, and any, any interactions obviously offer a, a potential contamination um, event. And more than that, it requires two people um, because it's, it's a very regulated process and it's so important that all the steps are followed correctly. You have somebody doing this process and then you have somebody else in the room, like the person in the picture, monitoring that they're doing the process right. And so all of these therapies need two people doing laborious things for a long period of time. And so we've been working closely with cell therapy manufacturers to find ways we might be able to improve this process. Um, and by doing that, we recognize that currently there aren't any online continuous contamination detection systems available. And by online, we mean continually sampling from the bulk cell therapy that's being grown um, and looking at that 24-7 um, to, to check that it remains sterile. And so that's why we've developed Pure Sentry, which is a fully automated real-time contamination detection system. And it uses the Prophecy event-based kit sensor, which is very fast and very sensitive, um, to particularly suit this challenge of detecting when contamination occurs. So this is uh, Pure Sentry, um, and it's got a, a few things highlighted on, on this slide. So first off, we understand that people who are working in these labs um, are wearing lots of PPE, lots of gear that makes it difficult to move. And so we've made sure that Pure Sentry is really easy to use by having a touch screen, large buttons, very accessible, and also easy to wipe clean to make sure it remains sterile between uses. Um, it's got some things like the uh, quick, easy to load um, peristaltic pump and solenoid valve that can be used one-handed um, and, and very easily to make sure that the process of setting Pure Sentry up is as frictionless as possible. And then moving over, a really important part is that Pure Sentry is compatible with industry standard cell culture vessels. So there's an example on the right here of a a G-Rex vessel, which is a static bioreactor, and so you would grow your T-cell cultures in this vessel while Pure Sentry is continually sampling from the vessel and monitoring uh, what's going on. And then to do that monitoring, we take the liquid out of the bio, um, out of the bio cell and pass it through our microfluidic chip, um, which puts the sample into the uh, thin format compatible with uh, our microscope and with the um, event-based camera. And all of this is um, completely closed loop, so there's no um, location where the cell culture is exposed to the air or has to be interacted with um, by a, a user. And looking at a, a diagram of what happens a bit more at the, um, the analysis end. So we've got this time, the, the previous reactor I showed you was a um, static bioreactor, a G-Rex. It's also compatible with mixing bioreactors where you um, use some form of motion to make sure the cells are being continuously distributed through the culture they're growing in. Um, again, we take these cells out um, through our closed loop system into our microfluidic chip. Uh, and then we have some optics, a standard um, lab microscope, imaging the cells and the, um, the contaminants. And then in the event-based camera, um, the property produced just interfaces with the microscope. It's a, a really great feature of it is that it's so quick to attach to standard lab equipment uh, for imaging. And then out of the property event-based camera, we get the stream of events that Luca was talking about. We turn those into pseudo frames, um, which I'll go into a bit more detail in a minute. Um, we then pass that to an AI event classifier algorithm. And that algorithm looks at the event stream that's coming out of the camera and says, am I currently seeing sterile events or contaminated events? Um, and then we have a decision algorithm that sits above that. And it says, based on what we've seen in the batch so far, is this whole batch sterile or not sterile? Because of course, you might not see a, a contaminant in every frame um, that we're looking at. And so we have this extra layer of the decision algorithm. And then that reports back to the, the lab user who's monitoring the samples that are being grown. So the first thing that we had to do was validate that 
um, our approach was going to work, specifically that contaminants would actually grow while they're in this new pure century environment. Because currently, um, what happens when you're growing cell cultures is they'll be in the, uh, the bio vessel where they're being cultured, um, and then they might be interacted with by the user when they take a sample out, but they're certainly not being continuously flown through a uh, microfluidic loop like we're doing. So we wanted to make sure that that still happened uh, with the pure century system. And so uh, what you can see here is that absolutely it does, um, specifically uh, contaminants and, and biological samples grow exponentially. Um, so they, they have a doubling time. And you can see the graph on the right showing that with our model contaminant, E. coli, we um, could see that exponential growth occurring within the pure century system. And I'll put some pictures of the uh, plates that we took off as well. Um, and so this is one way where, that you can do kind of standard sterility monitoring where you take some sample, you pipet it onto an agar plate, and then you see, um, does it grow over time? And here you can see that um, our starting colonies where we've got about four in that bottom left plate, they start to multiply and grow um, over the three hours and then the seven and a half hours. And so this gave us confidence that things would grow in our system and that we should have something to see. And particularly because the growth is exponential, if Pure Century is able to see individual bacteria um, growing in the cell culture, then we have potential to detect change very quickly because we have this exponential doubling. And so if we can monitor population over time, we had confidence we should be able to see contaminants much earlier than seven to 14 days used in the current, sum, current system. So now we get to some of the exciting bits. This is um, on the right, we have examples of some sterile frames captured with the Prophecy camera of T cells that we cultured here at uh, Cambridge Consultants flowing past the camera. Um, and then on the right, we have some contaminated um, samples flowing past the camera as well. And so what we're looking at here is that for the rocking bioreactors, the mixing bioreactors, um, where they're, they're using some kind of motion, some kind of stirring to promote cell growth, um, we end up with T cells and E. coli in the same space, both being imaged by the system. And so first off, we wanted to make sure, can the Prophecy camera see both T cells and E. coli? And here, clearly it can. In the left-hand set of sterile images, you can see circular T cells, um, and T cells are quite spherical in shape, and you see them uh, fairly large. They're on the order of five to 10 microns. And then in the right-hand set of images, we have our contaminated sample, where we still have those circular T cells at about five to 10 microns, but then we have some smaller things also present in the, the scene. So you can see some E. coli flowing through there. And they're more on the order of uh, half a micron to two to three microns, and they're rod-shaped rather than being circular. And so we cultured these in-house. We contaminated some of the T cell cultures that we had grown with E. coli, um, spiked it in, and then we monitored that with a sensor. Um, and we were very impressed that we could see both T cells, which are mostly water um, and typically quite hard to see under a, a normal microscope. Um, without using special imaging techniques, and E. coli, which are uh, represented differently under optical systems. Um, and particularly helpful here for machine learning is you can see the um, black border around the T cells. And this is the way that the Prophecy camera essentially does a form of edge detection in hardware. And so we can pick up the edges of our T cells to really see the morphology of them. Uh, so I'll change over to a video um, in a minute to share that with you. Um, of what the system looks like in motion. Uh, but just to talk through some of the benefits, um, we, the, in the video, you'll see uh, T cells being highlighted um, by the system and E. coli being highlighted as well. And you can see that they appear in the, the camera and what happens as they flow past. So I'll share that now. So hopefully you'll start to see um, the uh, system in motion. I'll, uh, it loops a couple of times, so I'll let it play. Um, but what you can see here is that our T cells flow relatively slowly based on the uh, properties of the microfluidic channel we're in. Um, there's also a bit of a flow gradient across the channel um, where liquid travels faster in the middle than at the edges. And you see some E. coli moving along there as well, kind of moving in and out of focus as they um, change their, their depth position in our microfluidic channel. And uh, I don't think you can see any in this video, but one of the really interesting things we could see with the uh, Prophecy camera, which we've not seen with uh, any imaging we've done in, in 
Microsoft's could be at chemistry consultants before, is you get some cartwheeling motion of the E. coli where they're rod shaped and as they flow through the chip at fairly high speeds, um, rather than traveling kind of in a, a straight line, they end up spinning around and you can see the rod um, rotating. And, and that's another nice way to tell apart the T cells that we're looking at and the E. coli that are flowing through. So there are a few things that are really helpful um, with the property camera and made it particularly well suited to this task of contamination detection in cell and gene therapy. Um, first off, we knew that this was going to be an AI problem. We've got potentially seven to 14 days of growing our cell cultures where we want to be looking at things and it's not feasible to have somebody manually reviewing that. And also the cells and the E. coli look different uh, batch to batch and there might be other things present. And so we knew we wanted an AI rather than a human operator or a hard-coded algorithm um, looking at what was going on. And the prophecy data streams that you get out, because they just show things that are changing in the scene, the, what you get is a really high density of meaningful information to look at. And that's great for doing low cost, low power uh, machine learning, and particularly for trying to do real-time machine learning, which is what we wanted to do. And so you get data that's well suited for the task that we we're trying to do. Also, Luca talked about the high dynamic range of the system. Um, and one way that this is really useful in this case is that we can use um, standard lab um, light sources to illuminate our sample and it's bright enough to see um, on the prophecy camera as you can see here and particularly as you um, increase the speed that the cells are flowing at the camera can continue to pick them up with a standard lab light source instead of having to move to higher power light sources potentially lasers which is what often happens um, for life sciences imaging uh, or strobed sensors and as well as being cheaper, the light source, another benefit is that you avoid any uh, photo bleaching and potential damage to the cells. And then the last part is it's well suited for scaling to um, cell culture around the world because the chips of prophecy produce are significantly cheaper than, say, um, some of the other optical techniques that uh, technologies that are available, like um, high frame rate cameras or um, optical street cameras. So now that we knew we could see both E. coli and T cells on the prophecy camera, the next question was, can an AI recognize them and tell apart our sterile and our contaminated batches? And the way we approached this question was um, wanting to understand, we could tell them apart by eye, and so what sort of features might be there to tell them apart with an AI? And we needed some insight to guide choice of our suitable machine learning algorithm, and particularly in this case, unsupervised algorithms that don't require a human operator to label data sets were really um, beneficial because it's a laborious process. Um, we did it early on in the development, and I think um, one of my team members labeled 90,000 images um, to help the machine learning algorithm understand what it was looking at. And that took a long time. It's not very interesting work, and it's not very scalable to different uh, types of contaminants. And so what we did here is we built a, um, a machine vision software um, to look at the frames and look at the size of objects flowing through them. And you can see in our sterile frame, we have mostly a monomodal distribution. There's some noise kind of, uh, at the smaller end of the, the size scale, but there's this hump of T cells flowing through the system. And then distinctly different in our contaminated data set, we have a bimodal distribution where there's just huge peak of E. coli that are flowing when we spike them in. And so we knew that we could see a difference and that computer vision could also see that difference. And so have good confidence that an unsupervised AI should also be able to see the difference. So that, what we did next was obviously developing that unsupervised AI. Um, and particularly what we recognized was important in this case is our E. coli are growing over time. And so we needed a system that could remember what it had seen before and detect some kind of change in the batch as the sample was becoming contaminated. So it could say, mm, it might be contaminated now. And then a bit later, it could say, oh, I've seen a lot more contaminants. It's definitely contaminated now. And so we needed some form of memory. And so what we used was a recurrent neural network, a long short-term memory model, LSTM. And in this, we have some kind of standard machine learning bits where we feed a frame in, um, and then we have some convolutional CNN layers looking at the frame and analyzing what happens. And then they feed the output, um, what they've interpreted from the frame into our LSTM, and that remembers this is what a sterile or a contaminated frame looks like. And in training, all we have to tell the model is the data set you're being given now is sterile, or the data set you're being given now is contaminated. And the model can understand what a sterile or a contaminated data set looks like, even as the frames are changing. And so our machine learning team were able to train the model to over 90% accuracy, 
um, in distinguishing sterile and contaminated batches uh, with just three days of computational effort. It was less than three days of time because we had a, a GPU cluster that we used for the training. And then we validated the model on three completely unseen data sets and achieved over 90% accuracy um, in, in distinguishing sterile and contaminated data sets for all of those runs. Thinking about what's next, we've tested Pure Sentry with E. coli, um, but at the start of the process, we talked to the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult, who are a UK government um, created body to help uh, promote cell and gene therapy development in the UK. And they, they came back to us and said there are 10 contaminants that are really relevant to the cell and gene therapy market. E. coli is one of them, uh, but we also considered how well could Pure Sentry adapt to the other nine contaminants that we'd not looked at. Uh, and so we've got here on the right a table of the other contaminants. So you can see E. coli at the top and then a, a number of different contaminants. And they have different morphologies, the different sizes and shapes, uh, but also they have different doubling times. And so we built a Poisson statistics model to look at what would happen to the population of the contaminant over time in the sample, knowing that Pure Sentry could recognize um, when contaminants were growing in the system. Uh, and we found that even in the worst case of uh, mycoplasma, we would still expect to see um, contamination within five and a half days in the worst case, which is much quicker than the seven to 14 days of a growth-based test, and that's for the worst case contaminant. Pure Century is relevant for cell and gene therapy, but it's also relevant for a number of other um, markets. So it's relevant for the, the food industry, potentially looking at um, ly uh, lycobacteri um, that grow in the milk industry, and it might be relevant for pollution monitoring in water or looking at algae health. Um, so we think there are a range of potential uses for the system and for Prophecy's camera. Um, and critically, what make it relevant to all these different areas is that it uses low-cost parts. It uses an unsupervised algorithm, so we can easily retrain it to new data sets for different markets. Um, and also, Luca mentioned that Prophecy now have a new fourth-generation sensor developed with uh, Sony. That wasn't the one we used, but it's higher resolution and has better dynamic range. And so you should be able to see smaller bacteria, get more clarity on the E. coli we were looking at, and also increase the um, flow rates of the sample to sample more solution in a shorter time um, due to the uh, improved dynamic range. Uh, and the sensor has also been proven with higher volumes and throughputs than we were using it on. Um, so we put together a white paper that goes into a bit more detail on this, so feel free to have a look. But um, now I'll hand back to Greg and be happy to answer any questions. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Josh. That's a yeah, really interesting presentation and uh, yeah, great great work doing something that you probably couldn't do with a uh, conventional imaging approach, or at least it would be very difficult to do with that. So we're now going to take a few questions um, and have a bit of a discussion. So if you have uh, questions, please do continue to drop those in. I know a few have come in already, so thank you very much for those people. Um, perhaps we could just uh, stick with you, Josh, quickly. Could you just tell us about the very beginning? How did you decide that an event-based approach would yeah. be a good idea or would be useful for this task or did you compare it to a standard imaging approach at all yeah absolutely so the the way it started is we saw a, a press release by prophecy about their new sensor and we we're very interested in what the sensor could do and where we could use it and then that kind of coincided with some discussions i was having uh, with other colleagues about uh, what could we do for the sound gene therapy market and how could we tackle this problem of not having any online sterility monitoring and we recognized that actually we might be able to bring them both together. And so we then launched into some kind of workshops to think about what are the pros and cons of event-based imaging. And one of the big things that stood out for this market was A, the relative small size of the data set you get from an event-based camera, which is really useful when we want to look at long periods of data, so the seven to 14 days of growth, um, but also the fact that it did do this kind of edge detection in hardware. And so we could ignore any kind of minor fluctuations of brightness, and any kind of small particles that might come through or, or bubbles in the system would be easier to ignore with the event-based camera. And that was really what drove us towards it. And the other part that was useful was we could use the standard microscope that we have and the light source we had and didn't have to worry about safety and development implementations of um, trying to build a laser into our system. Right, yeah, okay. Could you just um, quickly as well give us a bit of an insight into what it was like developing with the technology, is it similar or, di or different to um, like standard standard imaging approaches? 
Hmm, yeah, I think one of the things that stood out for us as being different, uh, two, two big things that were different. Um, one is for the machine learning uh, people we were working with, they're not familiar with event-based data. Uh, certainly at Cambridge Consultants were not, and there's an increasing body of academic literature that is get, becoming used to working with event streams and starting to think, how can we work with that? We did an initial foray into, could we work directly with the event-based streams and perform some kind of AI analysis of them? and found that was a bit of a hurdle to that. And so I think the work that Prophecy are doing to try and push the field of working directly with the event stream rather than the frame-based um, data was valuable. But it did offer a real benefit because we could create the frames at whatever frame rate we wanted with whatever amount of blurring we wanted because blurring is just lots of events um, over a period of time as the, the particle is moving through it. Um, and then we could kind of pick the framework we wanted for our camera that best suited the application. And that was a really nice thing about this. We could collect the data and then afterwards decide how do we want to partition it up into frames. Another difference uh, that was challenging in the lab is you can't focus the cameras in the same way you normally do. If you have a static sample, which is usually the way you want to focus, like a, a test target, you don't see it as you change the focus of the camera um, or the microscope because nothing's moving, nothing's changing, and you don't get any edges. And so we had to go through some iterations of a lab protocol to flow our sample in a very high concentration. Uh, the exact sample we were trying to look at, the E. coli, past the microscope, try to get somewhere near to focus so that we could suddenly see the E. coli appear on the camera and then hone in focus. And there was a bit of a challenge there with trying to work out what you could do um, to do that. Another way, if we had a light source that we could control programmatically, would be to flash it on and off and you would see the edges appearing there, but, but we didn't have a, a controllable light source. Um, yeah, I think those two are the differences. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a few questions for Luca, um, or at least they came in during Luca's presentation. So perhaps we could just take a few of those. So there's one about, um, uh, let me just see if I can find it. There's one about processing and whether, um, scroll up, uh, and whether, the, whether you use neuromorphic compute like uh, Gray. Uh, gray ml for example um uh perhaps you could could you could you give yeah. a bit a bit of information about sure. that yeah sure because it's i think it's a natural question uh in in the sense that uh, prophecy is developing the uh, uh the artificial model of the human eye so it would be natural to to connect the the eye with an artificial model of the brain uh, and, and there are uh, actually uh, many development ongoing uh, from both actually the, the, the startup world as well as the big corporation, like for example, uh, Intel. Intel is doing around the, the neuromorphic program, which is called Loihi, uh, which we are part, uh, which we are part of. Uh, so we do uh, look at uh, various um, uh, initiatives in, in, in that space. We have also partnership with uh, a spin-off of the uh, ETH Zurich, uh, which is called SynSense, which is also developing a spiking neural network. Because indeed, uh, there, is a, there is an interest of uh, uh, connecting uh, uh, our um, sensor, which is acquiring uh, asynchronously event uh, from, from the scene to uh, a, a computing platform, which is asynchronously also uh, processing this event uh, as they come, uh, which uh, uh, promise to lead to uh, extremely low power and low latency uh, processing. So we are actually looking to that. So we are, we are of course, very familiar also with uh, Grey Matter Labs, GML, which is also a spin-off from the Vision Institute in Paris, where we come from. So we are, we know the, that team. And we are also uh, uh, actually working with, uh, with them on some preliminary uh, evaluation of both technologies. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, someone asks Luca whether uh, it makes sense to put um, the prophecy sensor after an, an infrared camera, whether you can use it with infrared. Yes, it makes a lot of sense. Um, of course, our our technology today is in, in the visible and near infrared spectrum. Uh, we have done uh, uh, feasibility studies uh, quite uh, uh, actually in a, in a, um, in a um, uh, exhaustive way to, to assess the, 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 uh, the, the possibility to, to, to bring our technology also in other uh, wavelengths um, and is indeed possible to, to 
uh, to um, basically process uh, uh, our uh, array to uh, to also work in the uh, short wave infrared um, or long wave infrared and uh, it makes sense for certain uh, application because it would enable uh, basically uh, detection in in low light uh, situation uh, with uh, uh, low latency so for some for some application this is quite relevant um, as a as a uh, as a actually proof of the interest uh, for for this uh, for this combination of event based and infrared technologies for example uh, more than a year ago darpa the defense agency of the research uh, the, sorry the the research agency for for uh, um, the us uh, de defense uh, uh, has actually uh, started the program around um uh, event based infrared event based um uh, development which is uh, which uh, has also show some some success so uh, also demonstrating the interest overall for the industry uh, for this type of approaches yeah brilliant yeah thank thank you for that maybe one more one more for you um so someone asks about uh, tracking a fast moving object, but also needing to detect its initial location in the image frame before it starts moving. Can you, can you do that? Um, if the camera is static and the object is uh, static, uh, there is no such, uh, such an acquisition. You need either to, uh, move the camera, uh, and the object is static in the scene or the object in the scene starts moving. So at that point in time, you will, uh, you will see change event but as long as there is there is no relative motion uh between uh the camera and the target you are looking at the scene there is no there are no event the way you can uh, uh really um uh get around this uh, uh this challenge if if this is a challenge for your application because typically you can know in most of the application you can always assume that if there are there are no event it means that there is no there is nothing new compared to the initial state, so there is nothing in, informative to 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 care about. Uh, but in some cases, maybe this is relevant. Like uh, that's probably the reason of the question. So in this case, there are two possibilities: either you use you combine an event-based sensor uh, with a regular frame-based sensor that is meant actually to do this initial detection uh, of a static object uh, and then triggering an event-based sensor uh, to uh, to do, for example, a fast tracking, uh, or you can use some active light um, to illuminate the scene. So in that case, you would have you would have uh, um, a representation of the scene uh, with uh, also this uh, static object. Right. Okay. Uh, is that when you say active light? Is that the thing that uh, there's some work at e ETH Zurich about? Yeah, um, neuromorphic lighting, but is that is that different or? Yeah, there are different approaches actually um, that have been uh, published uh, in the past few years from universities, but also from a private company. For example, also Prophecy has been uh, actively uh, experimenting with and evaluating with customer the combination of uh, event based sensor with uh, uh, active light, and we will be actually soon also make an announcement around. A collaboration we are doing with uh, one of the market leader uh, in um, uh, light projector uh, for various uh, uh, application field uh, which include uh, robotics uh, industrial automation uh, as well as uh, uh, for example uh, consumer devices like uh, augmented reality headset for for localization um but uh, for example last year we we have published a collaboration with a company a swedish company called teranet uh, this company is using an original approach of uh, three event-based sensor with uh, one laser uh, dot that is uh, scanning the scene uh, very, very fast at very high frequency uh, in the range of 10 kilohertz. And because of the high time precision of the sensor, they're able to um, basically track uh, the, the, this, this laser dot in the scene and uh, from the information you get from the three cameras with very simple geometry they can triangulate and estimate depth uh, so in in the case of teranet uh, the use cases are around uh, uh, robotics robot robotic navigation as well as uh, potentially driving assistance so, uh, so for for cars okay 
in the, yes, okay. Interesting, interesting stuff. Uh, Josh, there's a question for you about, um, it says, from a practical perspective, were you able to do some transfer learning from non-event modality, or did you have to collect huge streams of labeled event data? I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's a, you... a really good question. Thanks. Um, one of the, I think what, one of the important things with machine learning is ultimately at the end of the day, you have to train it on the data you're actually looking at to, to get the accuracy. And particularly um, in our case with Pure Century, where we wanted to identify when a sterile sample began to change and be different, we may, had to make sure that we had lots of examples of the types of changes that were expected with an event based camera and the types of changes which were not and were, were related with a contaminated sample. But early on in the program, um, particularly when we were looking at what type of uh, machine learning do we want to use, um, we started with a conventional camera. Um, we collected data sets, um, and then we kind of turned that imaging data into uh, event-based data, simulated event-based data by doing um, some kind of edge detection techniques and um, things like that. We also just simulated some data uh, because we knew what our sample looked like. We knew the size of T cells and E. coli. Um, and we knew what the event-based data should look like, and so we just simulated uh, that as well. And that was all helpful for understanding um, maybe what size regions was it helpful to pass to our machine learning algorithm, um, and what, what types of layers might we need in the, the CNN that we were initially developing with. And so there was some useful stuff um, in there, but fundamentally, at the end of the day, we did have to collect uh, event-based data to really understand what did the, the system look like. Okay, yeah, okay, understood. Um, I don't know whether maybe you could have a go at answering this, but it, uh, how does the system handle slow changing parts of the image? Did you have that problem at all, Josh? Yeah, um, we did generally. Um, I guess in our application, when we had a slow moving system, we still had thin edges because the cells are mostly transparent in the middle and you get a lot of obscuration of light at the walls. And so even when our cells or bubbles are moving slowly past the scene, you could still see the edge moving uh, because there was a hard edge. And that, that I think is a really important thing to think about with a slow moving system. If what you care about is the edge, then even if it's moving slowly, that edge, if it's still covering more than one pixel, um, you can still see it moving. Uh, but you, there's also some adjustment that you can make with the Prophecy camera. Luke might be able to talk about that more, but you can customize kind of uh, how sensitive it is, what types of uh, change in contrast it's expecting to see, and also what sort of time periods it's, it's monitoring over, um, and so you can play around with that a bit too. Okay, L Luca, have you got anything to add on that? Yeah, I think I just explained very, very well. Um, in case of uh, slow motion, uh, slow moving part of the scene, uh, of course, uh, you need at least you need the minimum uh, uh, range of light contrast to detect the change because this is what is uh, at, the, at the end of the pixel level is triggering uh, is triggering the the event. You can of course, uh, depending on the application, uh, monitor certain and control and adjust a certain uh, parameters by a setting of the sensor to make it, for example, more 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 sensitive, capable to detect a lower um, contrast threshold. Uh, which make, of course, more more sensitive to uh, to, uh, for example, slow motion type of situation. So there are ways that can where the technology can be, of course, uh, adjusted according to the, the the application constraints or requirements. Right. Okay. Yep. Interesting. Okay. Maybe just one more image for. Oh, I don't know whether we've lost it completely. Uh, okay. Um, uh, may, uh, I didn't have one more question, but I'm not sure whether it's disappeared completely. Um, <laughs> but okay, um, there was there was a quick question about sensor fusion and whether it can be addressed, uh, whether you can uh, fuse it with lidar, I guess, or radar, for example. Um, this was to Luca. I don't know whether they quick just quickly mention that or answer that. Yeah. So we have some experience of uh, sensor fusion. Um, with uh, um, uh, conventional camera first, uh, because as I mentioned earlier, there could be a situation where you you need also the uh, RGB uh, information, for example, for uh, for for uh, for a static uh, uh, understanding of 
for the understanding of the, of the static scene and also because sometimes you want to combine the, the best of, of the two worlds so the um the space information the time information space information coming from the rgb camera and the time information coming from the event-based sensor sometimes because you have uh, um a, the need also to display uh, an image to uh, to uh, for a human consumption to an operator, for example, in surveillance application, uh, or for example, uh, in some computational imaging uh, application where we are currently active, for example, for some uh, interest uh, expressed by mobile OEMs, where the basic principle is to use the time information that the event space provide to improve image quality sometimes deteriorated due to the motion of uh, of a target uh, during uh, during the exposure time uh, of, um, of of a regular sensor while you are trying to to get uh, to capture a picture or or a video so these are our, our application where we are currently active uh, we have been in the past also active uh, looking at the fusion of uh, of uh, lidar and event based sensor but more in a in a in a in the approach i was referring to before with a more uh, an active light uh, assist based sensor itself to uh, potentially replace replace a lidar we have never so far worked on combining a 3d uh, output coming from a lidar with an event based uh, uh, um, a stream because uh, again the event-based sensor itself could be used also to produce 3d point cloud with uh, a suitable uh, active light system uh, the last point i want to mention fusion with radar is in principle quite interesting because the radar to some extent is also a, a time uh, um, uh, a, a sensor uh, um, but we is not something we have been uh, um, we have been exploring so far. Okay, understood. Yeah, understood. Uh, maybe just one last question for Josh because I found it now. Um, so it just asks how long it took bef uh, before you started concrete development. Was it days, weeks, months? Could you give an idea? Yeah, um, really, really quick to get up and running with the system. As I mentioned in my presentation, that we could connect it to the microscope, and that was great because it meant we didn't have to spend any time developing optical attachments or, or things like that. We could just culture our cells, get some E. coli, stick them under a microscope with a standard uh, kind of plate or a slide that you might look at them with. And then we could kind of quickly to see how do they look like. We could jiggle them around on the stage of the microscope or we could pump stuff around with manually with syringes. And so we were in the, the lab having a look at stuff within a week of getting the camera, uh, which was great. And then also, I don't think it's been mentioned, but you can develop for the camera with Python which was great for us because it also meant developing software and trying some of the automation was quick to iterate and quick for us to do. Brilliant. Okay, thanks very much, Josh. Okay, I think uh, with that, the hour's sort of up. We've all a few minutes over, but um, I think with that, I'll bring the webcast to a close. So it's going to remain live on our website um, for the next 12 months. That's www.imveurope.com uh, if you want to watch it again. Uh, so it just leaves me to thank our speakers, Luca and Josh, and also our sponsor, MacNica ATD Europe. And also thanks all for listening. Um, have a good day. <laughs>